In my sleep, I am startled by a sound, a hard, rapid thumping. I try to sleep through it, but then I not just hear the sound, but feel it, and I'm awake in an instant. The legs of my bed are rattling hard on the floor of my room. I open my eyes and turn my head to see the time, or try to. I cannot move. And this is not how it begins. This is how it ends. But it's not like I wasn't asking for it. The visitations start when I am a boy. At age six, I wake in the middle of the night to the sound of a hissing voice. A tall, thin man is standing in the far corner of my bedroom, lit by the moonlight streaming through the window. He wears a patchy three-piece suit. I can't see his feet. They're somehow blurry, even though everything else about him is clear in the silver light. He's whispering. His head is turned hard to the side like he's watching for something, a partner in a crime, a bank robber on lookout. I watch him for a moment. He turns his head away from the window toward me. He has no eyes. Then he takes long steps across the room before disappearing through the door. There's something wrong about the sound of his shoes on the floor. Hooves, it sounds like hooves. The visitors are strange and sometimes scary. Sometimes they are people. Sometimes not quite people. Mostly they come at night, but not always. Sometimes when the not quite people come, I can't move. It's scary, but rare at first. I try to tell my parents about these events, but they are dismissive. My father is a red-blooded construction worker and badass, and he has no time for trifling ass spirits in his son's room. <laughs> Fucking Aunt May, he mutters under his breath. <laughs> Go talk to your grandmother about that shit. Aunt May is Burke family code for spooky stuff. Just like depression, anxiety, and asthma, spooky stuff runs in our family. <laughs> we had an Aunt May back east, I know, but I don't know why everyone talks about her in hushed tones until I hear the story. The story goes that Grandma and Aunt May were about the same age and walked to school together every day in Newcastle, Pennsylvania. One of the houses they passed on their route had a vicious little cur of a dog that often got loose through a hole in the fence. It chased them, causing them to slip on the ice in the colder months. They asked the owner to do something, but he refused, unconcerned. One day, the dog bit Aunt May and tore her dress, and things took a turn. The next day, Aunt May took Grandma's hand and led her into an open field behind their neighborhood. In a patch of bare earth, she drew a rough picture of a little dog with a long tree branch. Aunt May muttered something harsh under her breath in their native German as she drew three circles around the picture of the dog. Then she put one end of the stick in the center of the circle and stepped hard on it, snapping it in two. Grandma and Aunt May were never bothered by the little dog again. Alone, Grandma went to the house where the dog lived and knocked on the door. When the owner answered, Grandma asked what had happened to the little dog. He broke his leg, the owner said. I had to put him down. I come from a spooky family. So when I tell my grandmother about the visitors, she smiles sadly. Oh, honey, you've got it too. Grandma tells me that these beings do not belong here and that they are probably as scared of me as I am of them. But Grandma, what do I do when they won't leave? She gives me the sad smile again. You just explain it to them. And then she teaches me how. Years later in college, I am living in a rented room near SDSU. The house is perched on the edge of a canyon and my bedroom has long floor to ceiling windows in one corner. I push my bed into that corner so I can lay with the windows open in the summertime. I fall asleep looking up at the tall eucalyptus trees as they sway in the faint breeze. It's like sleeping outside, and I love it. On a hot summer night, I wake suddenly from a brutal nightmare. My eyes flash open, my breath coming out fast and hot. My alarm clock blinks 2.22. 
I look out at the trees in the canyon and realize something is off. The sky is preternaturally dark. There is no moon. There are no stars. No reflected light from nearby El Cajon Boulevard and none of the faint ubiquitous traffic sounds. The trees in the canyon are as still as sentinels. The darkness is total. It's wrong. The temperature in the room drops instantly and a wave of revulsion crashes over me. Two dread-soaked words fall out of my scratchy throat. Oh no. An ice cold wind begins blowing hard through the windows. I shiver uncontrollably trying to reach for the covers at my feet, but I can't move. My dread gives way to terror as a shadow glides into the room. The windows are open, I think stupidly, but the screens are intact. How did something manage to get in? But this is not an errant bird. Floating in the center of the room is a focus in the darkness, a darker darkness. I have never seen anything like it, and I hope I never will again. It is a limitless fountain of black, noxious smoke pouring into the air around it. Where eyes might be are two yawning chasms that pulse with a dirty yellow emptiness. And as I look into its eyes, which Grandma had told me never to do, it begins gliding toward me. It is so angry. It hates me. I can feel it physically in my skin like a deep flash burn. And in that moment, I get it. This visitor, this thing, whatever it is, it had given me the bad dream. It had been feeding on my fear. I wasn't supposed to, but I woke up. I interrupted its meal, and it's not done eating yet. In a single terrifying motion, it rotates from vertical to horizontal, quickening its glide toward me. I hear myself whimper. I feel a sickening crackle in my skin as it drifts closer, like a dark, high, cirrus cloud. It's the most horrifying thing I've ever experienced. In a distant part of my mind, I know that I have to break its hold before it is floating directly over me, and I have to do it fast, but I have no idea how. And then I remember, I do know how to do this. Grandma taught me. I've done it before. In my profound fear, I'd nearly forgotten. The clarity is breaking in my mind like dawn. I cannot speak, but silently I begin to pray. It is a Buddhist chant. After a few repetitions, I find that I can almost move. My heart feels like it will burst from the polar combination of terror and hope. I focus hard on the chant, and a slurred version begins falling out of my mouth. Then, just as Grandma taught me, I imagine a pure white light pouring into the room, a blazing antidote to the thick, awful darkness. The cold wind becomes gale force, and I feel a shockwave of renewed, wage from the th of renewed rage from the thing floating over me, but now I have momentum, and the chant can be heard in the darkness of my room. nam ya ho renge kyo nam ya ho renge kyo nam ya ho renge kyo it is the Buddhist chant from the Tina Turner biopic, What's Love Got to Do With It? <laughs> Grandma from Pennsylvania and Tina Turner from Nutbush are helping me ghost bust this asshole. <laughs> what the cinnamon toast fuck, I think? <laughs> if I were not so scared, I could have laughed. And then I do, and my laughter breaks the spell, and I can move. I grab the covers at my feet and pull them up to my neck in one fast, shaky motion. And with a whoosh, the visitor and the freezing wind and the darker, darker darkness fly out of my bedroom into the canyon, restoring my room to its pre-nightmare state. I lay there panting for several minutes in my sweat, in my exhaustion, in my relief. Tears are cold and tight on my face. I look out the long windows. The stars are back. The sound of traffic on the boulevard, something I never thought I'd be grateful for, is back. The topmost branches of the eucalyptus tree sway gently in the canyon again. New tears of relief pour out of my eyes. 
I stagger to the bathroom, drunk with fatigue and shock. There is a new stark patch of white hair on the side of my head. The next morning, something has changed. This is war, spiritual war, and I have come to fight it. Me, Aunt May, Grandma, and Ms. Turner. <laughs> At night, the visitors come. By day, as a chaplain, I focus on trauma and negative emotions in my clients, and sometimes I find non-physical beings attached to them. They are often drawn to the client as a result of a discreet, shattering moment. Sometimes they're invited in as a protector, as a guide, as a friend, but in time, they reveal their true nature as parasites. I find that pulling these beings out of a client's space is easy getting the client ready to let it go, no matter how nasty it is, continues to be much harder. We become addicted to our darkest friends. The visitations continue. I receive one or two a month. I have the means to deal with them. I win all the battles, but they leave me exhausted and scared. For years, I grapple with these beings in the cold dark alone. The people in my life don't know or don't want to. I feel isolated and strange. My hair goes white at an astonishing rate. My health declines. Insomnia, depression, and chronic pain exact heavy tolls. I am growing tired of the war. Years later, in what becomes the last battle of that war, a friend posts on Facebook about the strange goings on in his home near Balboa Park. He is eminently practical, a naval officer with a master's degree and a keen financial acumen. He does not suffer bullshit. But what is happening in his home is getting worse and he is scared. I go over to assess the situation and help if I can. There are a variety of phenomena, none of which are unfamiliar. Lights flickering, door chains rattling, cupboard doors opening and closing themselves, cold spots, odd smells, the dog refusing to go into certain rooms and barking at dead air. My friend and his roommate tell me that, the mo that most of this happens while they're at home well within their view, which means whatever has taken up residence is not only annoying, but bold. Most disturbing is what has been happening for several weeks in his bedroom. And this is where I find the worst entity of all. My friend has stopped sleeping in his own room because the legs of his bed started rattling on the floor in the middle of the night. He is sleeping in his roommate's bedroom, a sympathetic but entirely skeptical guy who works a blue collar job. This admission gives me a chill. My friend had abandoned his own space, which in their world, the visitor's world, is a tacit invitation to stay and an invited entity, one given permission, is much more powerful and much harder to deal with. I perform a thorough cleansing and blessing of the apartment and release all of the beings that had taken up residence. The hard part is over. Your home is clean, I pronounce. As I leave, my friend's dog jumps up on me and licks my face. I take it as a good sign. Animals, no. I give my friend and his roommate maintenance protocols, exercises to keep their home energetically clean. I know from long experience that most clients don't comply with this step, but I give them anyway. Three weeks later, I am falling asleep and my phone rings. It is not my friends, but his roommates, his skeptical Downing Thomas roommates in a blind panic. His speech is rapid and incoherent. When I help him calm down, he says something that makes my blood run cold. Now it's my bed that's shaking. I don't know what to do. What do I do? You've got to come over, please. It's late, and I am tired. And by now, I've been trained to do entity removals remotely, years before remote work is a thing. <laughs> I assure him I will handle it from home, and we hang up. Then I get to work, but I'm tired, I am lazy, I make rookie mistakes. 
but I X the bastard out of my friend's apartment again and go to sleep. Three hours later, I wake up choking, unable to breathe. My bed, my bed is rattling on the floor. I look down and see the imprint of a hand pressing into my chest. It is not a human hand. There are too many fingers. In the darkest corner of the room, I see it, red and green fire, a contained storm, a malevolent fury that smells like rot. It freezes the space around it so cold I can see my weakened breath. I react without thinking. There is no strategy. There is no protocol. I am not scared. For the first time, I am not scared. I am pissed off. <laughs> Get out, I hiss between my teeth. My spittle turns cold on my lips. I am furious. I do not fill the room with white light. I do not pray to Ms. Turner or Grandma or anybody else. This thing, this evil, has no right to be here to fuck with me, to fuck with my friends, or to even walk the earth. I know this suddenly, <laughs> deeply, right down to my bones. It does not belong. This is not its world. It's mine. The pressure on my chest relents. I can breathe. The entity retreats, shrinking, and then I know fear. Fear had been my invitation. Fighting them all these years, crossing swords with these beings, and engaging them on their own terms, even when I won, it was my invitation. It was permission. I sit up and I look directly at it. It roils in the shadows of the room and moves toward me. A taunt, a feint intended to scare me, to regain control. But that's done. I say four simple words. I revoke my permission. The red-green fire simmers and pulses. There is a horrible, faint keening sound, like a dying bird. You're out. You're gone. And just like that, it is. I lay in my bed, panting. My fear is gone, and so is the thing. And this is when the visitations stop. It's so simple. It's something that none of my mentors or even grandma or aunt May knew. I don't have night visitors anymore. They don't come looking for me. But I still go looking for them. They attach themselves to clients, family members, friends, and strangers. Sometimes they move into places they do not belong. Sometimes I let them be for the moment, but I make sure they clock me. <laughs> and I lay my proverbial gun on the table, and then I know that they know. Sometimes I deal with them by revoking their permission to exist here. No battles, no effort, no ghost busting, no drama. And this brings me to my PSA. If or when you encounter a visitor like this, and I hope you never do, but if you do, remember, do not invite them in. Do not give up your space. This is an invitation. Do not accept gifts from them, including information. This is an invitation. Above all, do not be afraid. Fear is a spell they cast. It is an invitation. Do not accept it. They do not have the right to be here. This is not their world. It's ours. You just might have to explain that to them. Thank you. Thank you, J.D. Burke.